Welcome to Interspecies Conversations. This is a regular online lecture and workshop series that gives the opportunity to invite leading professors, scientists, researchers, and students to share and present work that contributes to advancing the acceleration and understanding of the diversity, forms, and functions of, community, of communication in other species. So I'm Kate Armstrong, I'm Head of Program for the Interspecies Internet, and it's my pleasure to welcome everybody today on behalf of the trustees and the organisation. Today we are joined by Oscar Salguero from Interspecies Library, and this talk will be called Interspecies Library, Books as Portals to Interspecies Futures. So Interspecies Library is the first archive dedicated to the study and advancement of artist books exploring alternative interspecies futures. Founded in 2019 by Oscar, the growing collection aspires to reflect our changing attitudes towards the non-human as well as our evolving acknowledgement of their agency, intelligence and wisdom. In this presentation, we will look at the history of interspecies literature and publications with special attention to those manifesting at the intersection of artistic research and the scientific imagination. Going as far back as 1665 and all the way to 2000, uh, 2023 and beyond, we will attempt to trace an alternative interspecies discourse timeline via a selection of visionary artist books. So with that, I will pass over to Oscar. Thank you, Kate. Um, and thank you to the Interspecies uh, Internet community for this invitation. So let me share my um, presentation here and you guys can confirm that you can see the first slide. Uh, is that showing? Not yet. Not yet, okay, let me see one second. Okay. Now it should be, right? We see your slide deck, yes. Great, awesome. Yes, yeah, so um, as Kay was saying, this is titled Interspecies Library, Books as Portals into Interspecies Futures. So what I'm gonna do today is I'll just give you a sort of, um, um, a timeline of books that are related to our, uh, our relationship with other species, in particular at the intersection of the scientific imagination and artistic research. So first, um, I'll go through a few eras that I have identified from the perspective of books. And then I will um, introduce the concept of interspecies futures. And then finally, the uh, idea of an interspecies library. So we can begin, for example, with uh, a proto era. So an era that encompasses enlightenment and romanticism uh, when science and art were uh, being taken um, uh, very seriously as, as complementary uh, or pioneering techniques to observe the natural world. Uh, one book that in particular is very exciting from this time is uh, Micrographia, 1665, by uh, Robert Hooke from uh, the UK. He was a member of the Royal Society of London. Uh, he developed also an earlier uh, version of the microscope or a compound microscope, which allowed him to explore uh, the micro world. So this is uh, one of the first instances where we see for example, um, tissue or a piece of cork in this case. And in this book, he is, the, he is attributed to the discovery of the cell uh, as he was referring to these this gaps in a, in a piece of cork cells. So for that is extremely important, but also for in, in the case that I'm studying for this particular foldout, which is the first representation of a flea at a monstrous scale. So at the time, we um, these creatures have never been observed by the naked eye, of course. 
So this uh, represented a significant leap into our understanding of the realm of different uh, of organisms that uh, operate at a different level. So what is interesting is that this was 1665, and at the same year and the year after, it was the Great Plague of London. And it was a mystery what caused it, but then later they realized that it was, um, it was caused by Yersinia pestis bacterium, which is usually transmitted to humans by the bite of a flea or a louse. And the book also represented a louse, as you can see in this uh, fold out. So really impressive coincidence that happened. Uh, the next book I want to highlight is a book called Photography of British Algae by um, UK botanist and photographer Anna Atkins, uh, whose father was a scientist at the Royal Entomological Society of London. And at that time, women were not necessarily allowed to participate in uh, this sort of scientific um, roles, so they tended to become illustrators and participate by drawing the uh, or the observations in natural environments. So in her case, she was uh, she participated by drawing shells and in different herbarium publications. Uh, she was friends with John Herschel, who invented a year before this book, a process called the cyanotype uh, photographic process, which involves light exposure and uh, chemical and chemicals to represent one-to-one uh, -one scale objects onto paper. So she was a pioneer. She basically uh, used this brand new technique in order to capture uh, British algae, seaweed. So it is incredible that for the first time they were they were able to capture these organisms. Uh, on the one-to-one -one scale. And another kind of interesting fact about Anna Atkins is that she was also a fictional novelist. So just to show you that uh, the curiosity of these authors goes beyond science and sometimes even leaps to fiction. The other phase I, wanna, I wanted to show you that I'm identifying here is one I call, uh, one I call speculative evolution between 1850 and 1990. Um, this is when we start to see at the natural world and try to imagine, speculate ways it, it adapts or evolves, either as a consequence of natural uh, natural things or uh, interaction with humans. So a very influential one, of course, is on the origin of species by Charles Darwin, 1859, uh, regarded as the foundation of evolutionary biology, uh, also this idea of uh, natural selection. But there is one particular page in this book that I like to highlight is page uh, 184, 184, where Darwin says, in North America, the black bear was seen by Samuel Hearn swimming for hours with widely open mouth, thus catching like a whale insects in the water. I can see no difficulty in a race of bears being rendered by natural selection more and more aquatic in their structure and habits with larger and larger mouths till a creature was produced as monstrous as a whale. So this was a really radical um, idea that he proposed in, in, in this paragraph. He was suggesting that a bear could turn into a whale over millions of years. And at the time it was ridiculed. It was considered outlandish. So he actually, even later uh, editions, he's changed the last line from produce as monstrous as a whale to almost like a whale. So this is an earlier example of a speculative evolution. Another interesting example, now leaping to the 1900s, in 1961 was the, um, the publication of this book, The Snouters, Form and Life of the Rhinograts by uh, Dr. Harald Stumke from Germany, who is a naturalist. So the idea is that this book represents uh, a very specific type of species. There are like shrew-like shrew mammals who evolved to use their nose in unusual ways. So apparently these animals just were present in a Pacific archipelago 
and their habitat was destroyed due to a nearby atomic bomb testing. So this is the only documentation of those species. The thing is, this was later proved to be a hoax or what they call a scholar hoax or biological hoax. And the real author was German zoologist, Gerald Steiner. But the book remains a really interesting example of what happens when scientists allows themselves a poetic, poetic license to imagine what the, um, the effects of human on a local ecology, um, what those effects can be like or what it could destroy. So these are some illustrations from the book. Um, it's incredibly detailed with taxonomy and anatomy studies. It's a fantastic book. So that book, I think, also influences uh, a later, also famous book in speculative uh, evolution, which is After Man, A Zoology of the Future by um, paleontologists and geologists from Scotland, Dougal Dixon. So this book is an imagination of what happens when humans are outside the picture, when we are completely extinct, what sort of species will evolve millions of years past our um, our presence in this planet. So what's interesting is that the introduction of the book was by uh, Desmond Morris, who is an English ethologist and zoologist, but also a surrealist painter. Uh, Dougal Dixon, who is a scientist, was inspired by science fiction, books like The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. Um, and he developed a hundred, uh, over a hundred new types of species presented in a book whose format is like a natural field guide. Um, something interesting about the uh, incentive of Dougal Dixon to do this is that I remember talking to him a couple of years ago and he mentioned that there was a campaign by Greenpeace in the 70s called Save the Whales. But Dougal Dixon's position was what happens when the whales are gone? So this is what led him to produce this sort of um, speculative book. Uh, he also called this era the post homic era, so era after humans. Uh, and the only survivors of a mass extinction event are these new species. Um, for example, here on the left, this is a species he calls uh, vortex or Balenonis divipara. Divipara is a 12 meter long oceanic penguin species and the largest animal to inhabit the Earth 50 million years into the future. So as you can see, it adopts shape and form of a whale. Another phase um, is one that um, I call animal intelligence and communication, which results from new studies into animal cognition in the 60s, all the way to the 90s. Um, but also, I want to show a, a couple of examples from conceptual artists around this time. So we can start, obviously, with uh, the work of John C. Lilly, a neuroscientist, but also a counterculture scientist uh, from America who is studying the bottle, bottlenose uh, dolphins and their vocalization and their communication. So he was trying to teach them um, human speech. English in particular, in a project that was funded by NASA uh, in the 60s. He believed that future, future human and dolphin communication would be possible within a decade or two. But the project was uh, involved, uh, it was involved in a lot of controversy because of uh, vivisection, the supplying the dolphins of LSD, and also a, a relationship with a young woman and a dolphin that was uh, sort of, a, of sexual nature. So all of these things sort of led to a lot of controversy and the eventual defunding of the project. But one thing I find interesting is that around the same time, um, an American avant-garde collective called Ant Farm suggested the idea of a dolphin embassy. A dolphin embassy was a, a entirely conceptual, as a, a research project that was never built uh, that proposes um, uh, this space, this neutral space where dolphins and humans can communicate in an aqua terrestrial envir environment. So the idea is to um, push for contact, communication, and co-evolution between both species. 
And this is sort of a rendering of what this station could look like. Um, but at the same time, it criticizes the idea of uh, human geopolitical architecture by adopting the, the concept of an embassy. So I find that interesting. Um, but the beautiful aspect of it is that it's almost a, an earlier proposal of what happens when you, you um, have this common space where you can voluntarily uh, enter whether you're a dolphin or a human and sort of establish a contact. I think in some ways, this project um, influences maybe our projects that are happening now, like uh, SETI, Cetacean Translation Initiative, this idea of like a less invasive, more like um, uh, let's listen to not in captivity, but in their natural environment. Um, another example is in 1979, of course, Roger Payne was the discoverer of whale song in 1967. And to me, this is an incredible example of what happens when a scientist convinces a, um, a widely popular magazine to publish a flexi disc of the sounds of whale. So this is the January um, 1979 issue. 10.5 million copies were produced. And apparently this was an important, um, a very important uh, experiment because it really inspired a lot of scientists and artists in their earlier years when they were, when they had access to, to such an incredible artifact. I mean, imagine infiltrating the sounds of another species of, into a regular magazine. That was an incredible uh, idea. So here are some uh, spectrograph, oral spectrograph renderings uh, from 1963 that Roger Payne uh, was producing. Uh, it was part of his paper that, from 1971 about whale song. And I show you this one because the next slide um, creates an interesting parallel. So this is Benjamin Patterson, an African-American, um, conceptual artist, part of the Fluxus movement. Um, he was already also very interested in what happens when you um, consider the agency and intelligence of other species as part of uh, a learning moment. So in this case, he was, uh, this is called ants. He basically uh, let ants free on a piece of paper and photographed that. And that became the basis for him to to compose music based on this, uh, the agency of these uh, small insects. So he called this uh, an approach to aleatoric or chance-based music. And speaking of also chance-based, like of course, we also have the, the work of John Cage, famous music theorist, uh, American avant-garde composer, who in 1972, develop uh, these uh, edition 75 copies of a book called Mushroom Book, which he collaborates with a mycologist, Alexander Smith, and an artist, Lois Long, who contributed with uh, illustrations of mushrooms. So Cage contributed by presenting a handwritten text and poetry dedicated to mushrooms. And um, of course, as we know, there's a, a lot of interest in, in mushrooms these days. Um, he founded, co-founded the New York Mycological Society in the 50s. Um, and recently, in 2020, a small publisher from Canada, Atelier Editions, reissued the entire, the entire book with additional um, context called A Mycological Foray. And uh, it's important to know like this, this relationship between a composer and another species. He even said, there's a quote that I have here. Um, I have come to the conclusion that much can be learned about music by devoting oneself to the mushroom. The next phase uh, between the 90s and early 20th, 21st century is the genetic turn. So here's where a lot of advances in biotechnology, um, resurrection biology, cloning, 
uh, really starts to affect our relationship with other species. I mean, in 1987, uh, we had genetically modified organisms being ac accepted um, by FDA. In 1996, we have the uh, dolly, the first cloned animal, the sheep. Um, and so how does this affect um, the production of books, the production of uh, fictions? Um, of course, we have the Jurassic Park in 1990, which is a work of science fiction by Michael Crichton, who actually has a, a MD from Harvard Medical School. So he all comes from a scientific background as well. Uh, and this is one of the first instances in which the concept of resurrection biology or the extinction enters the mainstream, in particular with the, the, the film that was produced in 1994. And actually here on the, on the right side, I put a little, um, this is um, the sort of like the, what do you call the park pamphlet from the movie, which is also printed. So I, I like the fact that these fictions are also printed. Um, throughout the late nineties, also we have uh, Eduardo Katz, a Brazilian American artist who um, started to play with the idea of uh, genetics and coin terms such as bio art, trans transgenic art. Um, so a famous project is GFP Bunny, which is uh, the idea of like uh, incorporating a green fluorescent protein into a, a, a rabbit which comes from a jellyfish, this protein, and it allows it to glow green under UV light. So when this project was presented, which is also very controversial, you know, now artists are playing with life, with the code of life, with DNA. Uh, they're creating chim chimerical sort of new animals. It's, it's, it's an outrage, right? So this book, It's Not Easy Being Green, was produced in 100 copies in 2003. And I find it very interesting because it documents all of the outcry from the public, from the internet, from different newspapers or news stations in response to this project. I mean, this is a, a very interesting example of also how are in some way, he was also suggesting, how are we going to relate to animals that are now willing, I mean, that are now um, um, modified in the open, so are mutated? What kind of new interspecies relationships we develop with these uh, modified organisms? And the phase that I'm um, deeply exploring right now, which I call in species futures for different reasons. It's one that documents works, uh, books that are being produced uh, this first quarter of the 21st century. So a lot of the influence here comes from um, the post-humanities, it comes from uh, fiction, it comes from future studies, but also the level and the speed at which many things are happening around us. Biotechnology is moving incredibly fast, AI, um, and all sorts of emerging technologies. And so this is, these books are being produced as a response to, to these changes. I identify these books, for example, these publications. One on the left side is by Ursula Le Guin. It's one of her many books. This one is called the world. Uh, the word for world is forest, 1972. So Ursula Le Guin employed a lot of speculative fiction to talk about uh, subjects such as environmentalism, colonialism, ecology, but also interspecies relationships. And on the right side, we have a book by Donna Haraway, "Staying with the Trouble" from 2016, which. Um, it's a call for de-anthropocentrism and more ethical and respectful ways of relating to non-human beings. So on one side is fiction and the other side is more theoretical. And these sort of books are what inspire a lot of the artists that I will be presenting to you that are part of this uh, sort of next phase of uh, interspecies related books. So in 2021, um, 
I was um, invited by Center for Book Arts to present uh, an earlier version of this, of this collection. So the, the presentation was called Interspecies Futures, If. And this is the book that I produced, uh, 100 copies, along with uh, uh, Claudio de la Torre, who I think is join, has joined here. Um, so this book is a, an attempt to sort of create a survey of these, these earlier publications or documents. So this is the poster of the show in the species futures uh, in the spring of 2021. Um, I had a chance to present them with a couple of historical also documents um, to complement the narrative here. Uh, on the right side of this large table, I presented books that were produced between 2016 and 2019. And on the left side were books that I commissioned specifically for the show. So these were five different artists who produced books related to, um, to bats, crayfish, um, pollinators, chickens. So this is so, just some more uh, images of the presentation. And it was also a first chance to, to, to show the interspecies library as a proper sort of um, project on its own. So interspecies library was, was uh, established in 2019. Uh, it started as a series of like of basically presentations I was I was doing in my apartment here in Brooklyn, New York. The first one was called Human on Human, where ten books on interspecies interactions were presented. Um, different people came in, and it sort of inspired me to uh, to present this at a larger, more public way. So I'm going to show you some, just some examples of the type of books that I am gathering with this project. For instance, we have uh, Aurelia Immortal by Spanish sculptor Javier Viver. This is from 2017, which is a, a book that is a leporello or an accordion that is uh, supposed to be presented in this way, represent, which represents the uh, immortality of uh, a jellyfish, which is a, a species that is now known to achieve biological immortality. So the project is um, a sort of a critical, from a critical perspective, is suggesting that a corporation might in the future utilize this DNA or this research for transhumanist pur uh, purposes. So what happens if you apply the learnings from this and use it to uh, achieve immortality in humans? Another example is the uh, Arachnid Orchestra Jam Sessions by Tomás Araceno from Argentina. So this is from 2017. It's a documentation of his project in which he collaborates with uh, other, um, with uh, a couple of species of spiders. So what's happening here is um, using contact mics and documenting the vibration of spiders. And along with that, playing some music with a group of performers. And so this is a connection mediated by, by sound with other species. One thing I enjoy about this book is that uh, I didn't include it here, but at the back of the book, in the section of contributors, it lists the species first and then the anthropos, which are the humans. Another example is the Unextinct Dodo project, which was a, a thesis project by Ege Koko who is, lives in Austria. Um, and this is presented as a fictional corporate catalog of dodos that in some undetermined future, some company will be able to uh, bring back these as pets, extinct animals uh, as novelty pets. So this is an anticipation of that uh, possible reality. Uh, a book that was commissioned for the show is this one called uh, Pink Chicken Project by Non-Human Nonsense, which was presented as a, as a slab, as a rock piece with a uh, fossilized chicken in the front. And the idea is that they were studying 
and what is the one species that we have modified the most and that we consume the most in the world and that is the chicken the common chicken we consume billions of them a year so the thesis is what happens if we modify genetically the chicken to be a different color so their bones their feathers are all pink and as a consequence they leave a trace of our effects on other organisms on earth in the geological strata so it is really um really out there it considers more like deep uh, concepts such as deep time and our effects on other species and another example here is by uh, queer communication designer Noam Young Raksan from uh, Korea, who's now based in Belgium. Uh, it's called the Hy Hypothetical Eocentric Atlas on How Humans Have Sex. So we still don't understand, for example, how eels um, reproduce. So this book is really interesting in the sense that it imagines what if another species had to also imagine the way we reproduce as a different species. And the only evidence is whatever is on the oceans or whatever is on the water. And what if those things on the waters are just the pollution that we produce? So it's entirely speculative, but I enjoy the fact that it's attempting to understand our reality from the perspective of another species. And then this one, also another one produced for the show was Signal Crayfish by Christopher Oren from Denmark, which studies the uh, invasive species that is the signal crayfish who came from North America and is now all over Denmark and Nordic countries. So it's presented as a, almost as an absurdist sort of book with all of different, different chapters. Um, the bizarre sort of cultural and data infiltrations that, that are highlighted by by this idea of having an invasive species and the political implications of that. So um, the next thing I want to show you is what I consider is the phase that is happening now. It's a phase that um, is widely influenced by AI and non-human uh, communication studies. And some of the books that I'll, I'll show you are from 2000, yeah, starting in 2019, for example, Nimia is in Me by Jenna Sutella from Finland. is a hypothetical interaction between bacteria and AI. And this is a sort of the, the language that might be developed from this interaction between two non-human entities. Another interesting one is Degenerate Cultures by Cesar and Lois from Brazil and the US, which uh, pertains to the slime mold and how um, in their presentation is basically a communication between an AI and slime mold leaving traces on, on top of a book. So the book that you see here is, is for example, a book, um, I forget specifically which book they're using, but it's one that depicts our relationship with nature. So it's one of the classical science books and the slime mold is taking over the pages and, the, and there's a camera and AI is, the AI system is reading the words that are remaining. So it's an interesting example also like communication between two different species uh, along um, around a publication that is created by humans. And this one's from 2021 by uh, Marian Hofmeister Castro from Chile. And uh, it's a study of beavers, uh, traces, and, and knowing mar uh, marks that they leave on trees. And it's trying, she's trying to develop a hypothetical sort of beaver language um, based on uh, the marks that are left on tree trunks, maybe even um, try to emulate the sound that were produced when they were being um, um, utilized by the beavers. And a more recent example also is this one by Ning Jiang from France, which is uh, representing uh, heat communication with bees. So the entire book is just what the bees would observe in their community. 
So I would say there are a lot of interesting books recently uh, in terms of like uh, traditional or mainstream publications. All of the books that you're seeing here are from the year 2022. So we have an immense world by Ed Young, Ways of Being um, by James Bridle, How to Speak Well by Tom Mussel, who I understand was also presented a lecture here, uh, and Karen Backer, The Sounds of Life, who also presented here in a species internet. So this is to show you that just in one year, all of these books concerning non-human perception, communication, and intelligence have been released and are definitely influencing artists as well. Um, for instance, this um, book by Vincian Dupré, who is a famous ethologist from Belgium. I don't think it's been translated into English, but the title is Autobiographie d'un Pulp. It uses fantasy regarding non-human languages. She proposes um, the association of cosmophonic and paralinguistic sciences and how they're uh, decoding the spider vibrations and understanding that they are trying to communicate to us in different ways that we never considered before. Or a more recent book, this is from earlier this year. Uh, it's called RH Blueprint by K. Alara McDowell from the US. So the book is written in collaboration with Chat um, GPT-3, and it tells a story of uh, a future where artists, shamans, and AI researchers collaborate to preserve the ecosystem. So in the book, the author draws lessons from indigenous knowledges, neuroscience, art, psychedelic research, and other than human intelligence. So with all this said, there is one quote that I really think it's uh, important by Ulysses Carrion, who is a, um, was an archivist, uh, conceptual artist and archivist from Mexico. I firmly believe that every book that now exists will eventually disappear. And I see here no reason for lamentation. Like any other living organism, books will grow, multiply, change color, and eventually die. So I consider all of these books that I'm showing you, um, in some strange way, I agree with this. They're almost like organisms. Um, they um, they have a they have a they have a timeline. They I'm um, sorry. They have like a, they're not going to be here forever. They can become viral they can uh, change their, their, and for example, what I'm trying to do is, I'm thinking of this collection or this gathering of books also as an organism, a library as an organism, is something that continues to grow, continues to mutate and change. And one of my um, ideas right now is that I would like to turn this collection into an index. So an online index where anyone can see all of these books that are being produced around the world. Uh, and so this is a version that exists right now, synthesislibrary.com. It just shows a preview of the collection, just some of them, so that just to give a hint about the kind of um, the kind of documents that are being uh, preserved and curated here. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that I'm also looking at the future of these. To me, the most interesting thing about, the most interesting aspect about this is that it becomes also a hub for conversation. So I've been able to um, open the doors of my apartment to different researchers and artists, uh, scientists who want to come and, uh, and take a look at the books and have a conversation uh, and get some inspiration. So I think this is a very important part of this, this project the community aspect of it. So yes, that's the Interspecies Library project, um, the website, interspecieslibrary.com. There's also the Instagram and the, the email if anyone wants to, to stay in touch. Great, thank you, Oscar. 
this was so interesting and I think it really brings up a lot of different uh, ideas about how the work that we're doing often in the sciences is really connected to so much history and so much contextualization that comes from, in this case, uh, books. So I think that this is a, a very interesting space for us to be enlightened by and explore. I don't know if anybody has any questions starting off that we we can discuss. I see there's a few things being discussed in the chat, but is there anything coming up? If not, I actually, I also have questions, so I don't know if anyone else wants to jump ahead of me. <laughs> Claudia, do you, would you like to ask your question? Also, I see that uh, so Claudia is asking if are you up for donations and so how does how does that work? Yeah, so the project is right now independent. Uh, I do get donations. People that visit uh, the library, they bring their their work, that are, things that they're working on. Uh, mostly independent artists because they don't really have a representation beyond the what they what they are producing. They don't they don't have a, a big publisher. So they tend to produce really small copies, a small amount of copies, 10 copies, 50 copies, and they're happy to donate. Oftentimes, I mean, most of the time I support them. I purchase the copies, but sometimes they insist in donating and I'm happy to share their works as well. So there's no specific process. It's just uh, contact, you know, direct contact with me through Instagram or email. Um, yeah. Oscar, does that mean that the library itself is a physical archive and everything is physical, or is there also a digital aspect to it? Yeah, so at the, at the moment it's physical because um, it's just here in my apartment. Um, but I'm trying to push it as a digital archive as well, because I understand that a lot of people that are interested in these, these publications just don't have access to New York or they're from other parts of the world. And I would love to create an index um, that at least shows the, the whole variety of books and publications that are being developed from different parts of the world. And that maybe with uh, permission of some of the artists, we can also include the, the content, the full content of some of the books. Yeah, I think that sounds really positive. We work with also um, the Internet Archive. I don't think Mark is here today, but we have them in our community. And I don't know if maybe there'd be an interesting way to see if some of those actually also held in the collection, some of the more historic ones that you've discussed, because it could really create some kind of uh, digital kind of lineage to the, to the newer ones as well. Um, does anybody have any questions for Oscar while we... Of this okay we have Akash do would you like Akash would you like to ask your question or if you'd like I can ask it for you it's in the chat yeah um, I please how long you hope the library to be open I'd love to visit <laughs> yeah if you're if you're in New York just uh, send me an email uh, you know people just send me emails and it's it's kind of independent as I'm saying at the moment I mean less for example uh, two days ago, I had the visit of two Australian artists in the, who independently contacted me. Uh, they were visiting New York for a few days, so it just coincided and they came and we had a, a wonderful conversation. Question? Yes. We, um, in, in reaching out to other creatures and then trying to understand their experience we have to acknowledge that you know birds fly better than we do um fish swim a lot better and earthworms are much better at tumbling through the ground and so on and so forth you know ad infinitum what is very strange is when the creatures that we are investigating turn the tables on us and suddenly we find ourselves the subject of their investigations. This happened to me with a bottlenose dolphin. And uh, I wonder, first of all, if any other people have had this experience. And secondly, 
at what point does this start to shade off into things like uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence? Um, if we can't communicate with elephants at home, are we going to be able to communicate with elephants from Aldebaran? You know, that kind of question. And also, has anybody here read Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, about his first experience with the visitors, as he calls them? It contains a very interesting sentence, which I think goes something like, uh, how strange it was to feel oneself under the same type of dominance we have over the animals. And I think we ought to keep that in mind because we, we are obviously not the top of creation here, okay? There's at least a couple of layers of cream above us, that's all. Oscar, yeah, do you have any, um, oh, sorry. No, yes, absolutely, I mean, we, um... I think that's what's happening a lot with the, the artists these days that are they're really open to the idea of uh, different type of language and communication that might exist in other species. So there's a larger, you know, there's more openness to that, to researching that, to understanding or attempting to understand how far that goes. So yeah, it's 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 uh, yeah, it's part of this this era of exploration for sure. I think this, for me, this is also really interesting because this perspective is something that can be explored through literature, right? So you also have some of your books actually exploring the perspective of the animal as opposed to, you know, the perspective of the human being the, com yeah, the prime communicator. Yeah, there's a big push for like um, this idea of decentering the human in order to, um, yeah, and, and a lot of it is used with fiction, definitely the use of fiction, the use of uh, narratives, um, that helps a lot. So there is a question, I think, by Jesse. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for presenting, by the way. I really loved how you broke that into specific phases, which help us kind of understand the like, social and kind of political context going on. Um, my question was, I guess with that kind of evolution of the field of interspecies um, dialogue and communication, do you, it seems from my perspective, just like just starting to get into this, that our understanding and um, definition of communication is evolving and expanding quite a bit as we are maybe admitting that verbal communication is the way humans tend to primarily lean on communication. Obviously we have nonverbal cues and other ways of communication, but the examples you showed around like bees, for instance, the um, speculative work around what they see with heat mapping. Just curious if you could talk about that change um, and if you've noticed that kind of like different forms of communication like bioacoustics or biochemistry, do you think that's continuing to expand and maybe comment on other examples you've seen? Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Is, is con thank you for the question. Definitely is expanding. Uh, I mean, there's a whole portion of the the this this gathering, this collection that is dedicated to just uh, sound based uh, artifacts. So there's artists producing cassette tapes, records, um, where they um, they are attempting to capture uh, signals from other species, mushrooms plants, um, cetaceans, but from a perspective that's a little bit more um, more artistic. So there's a little bit more license to uh, interpret them. But I think that is, that is important also. I mean, it's, in, it's to be open to that, that this idea of um, their type of communication being so different and perhaps impossible for us to penetrate. Um, I understand like scientists are doing that right now a lot with the help of AI, for example. And as I show you some examples as well, there have been books already from 2019 and 2020 that were anticipating this idea of um, AI and even interspecies communications among species that are non-human. 
So what would that what would that look like? What kind of uh, aesthetics be uh, involved in that? Can I ask a quick follow up question? Uh, sure. um, I am studying costume and interest in speculative costume. And so I have to ask, have you seen any great examples of this related to a wearable or something on the body and how humans could physically perceive like something like a biochemical signal or um, a vibrational signal or anything like that? No, not so many, but there is a pro uh, project called Biodesign Challenge. It's based in New York, and they they look at our um, young designers or students who are uh, attempting to do things like that. So I haven't seen particularly books connected to that, but that may be an area that you can you can explore uh, in from the perspective of biomaterials or bioconnected. Uh, yeah, materials. So the project is called Biodesign Challenge. Thank you. Great. Any other questions for Oscar? Anyone else need to need to ask something? Any burning questions? I had one question, Oscar, which was really about the medium um, that you chose, which is books. I think this is something really interesting because a lot in our field are talking about actually digital applications and we're really talking about, you know, this idea of moving towards something which is is really being explored through digital capacity. And I wonder if, you know, what do you see as the future of books and why is this medium so important to you apart from I know you talked about this being kind of you know a, a moment in time that's what a book captures but how do you see this moving forward and do you think that you know artists are going to be taking up the the challenge let's say to be working on new species books what do you see as the kind of trends happening there yeah I mean this in the last 20 years or so there's been an explosion of uh, artist book fairs so um, gatherings and fairs around the world, especially, you know, especially in New York and the United States and Europe, and it's expanding. There's a, a growing interest in artist books, books developed by artists uh, exploring different topics. Uh, and in general, the younger audiences are still fascinated by this artifact, the book, which is a really old, you know, it's thousands of years old artifact and medium that still manages to captivate people because it's, it's still so such a perfect uh, medium. It's perfect for your hands. Um, it has weight, it has smell, it has different ways to engage with it. You can choose the, the, the sequencing experience uh, and how deeply you're involved and um, involved with it, right? It's a very intimate artifact. So I see, and there's, I see a lot of innovation, in fact, in this, in this medium. Um, and I'm continue, continuously surprised by what's being produced. I think it's going to stick around because it remains this artifact that, that demands your attention and your, and your involvement with it. So if I think far future, that's that's a hard question. I mean, I can see people still using books or producing books in the next few decades, but uh, you know, there's also this idea of like AI producing books, authored by AI, and then starting to confuse the 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 um, uh, the authorship, whether it's human based or AI based, and I think that's going to be a big deal, maybe in in a few years. Where's the the provenance of the 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 research coming from? Uh, but for now, books seems to still to be a very um, uh, efficient efficient medium. As I show you in twenty twenty two, all of these re uh, researchers and um, uh, scholars and theories are still using printed book as a way to present their concepts and ideas. 
If we've got a moment, I did have one more question here. I don't think I ever got an answer from anybody about um, whether having an experimental subject turn the tables on you. Uh, are there any scientists here that have encountered that in their work or research? Don't all speak at once. If you Thanks. don't find an answer in this forum, maybe it's worth posting in the Slack channels. I don't know if you're um, part of those channels. I can add the the Slack link here it's, um, and you can join and maybe there you will find the answer. You could post it on there so I can I can put the link here if you like and you can follow it up there. Thanks. Patricia, go ahead. You're still on mute. If you'd like to unmute, then we can. In response to Malcolm's question, um, I have spent a good deal of time with bonobos trying to understand what they know about the elements of music making. And I will tell you that um, I spent probably a year uh, engaged with the bonobos that Sue Savage Rumbaugh had in her laboratory, uh, and particularly Kanzi and Pambanisha. And as I got more and more involved with it, they actually pointed the direction that they wanted to participate with. <laughs> So instead of my imposing certain protocols on them, mm -hmm. they presented to me that they were much more interested in timing and rhythmic entrainment. So I flipped from engaging with them tonally, which they were very comfortable playing synthesizers because they grew up being able to use those as tools, I flipped that from going into tonal or melodic uh, investigation into a, a timing rhythmic entrainment uh, experiment, particularly because Kanzi kept insisting on entraining to my rhythm. And finally, I got the message that that was what they were interested in. And so by paying attention essentially to their insistence on going in that direction uh, over the course of a couple of years, we established that bonobos have the ability to entrain to an external beat, which had at that point uh, not been uh, uh, demonstrated or proven uh, in, a, uh, in a, a context that was scientific. And so consequently, we have then applied that same set of protocols on a group of bonobos in a zoo that um, had not been uh, particularly brought into the musical world as Kanzi and Pamanisha were, uh, so that we established that that entire species has the ability and uses uh, rhythmic entrainment as part of their survival technique. But up to that point, uh, it, it was not a scientifically proven principle. So thank you to Kanzi and Pandanisha for you know, insisting that I pay attention to what they were interested in. And it only took them two years to teach you about this. I mean, I think you, you are probably the subject of several Bonobo research papers that you don't know about. <laughs> Well, I was slow. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we we're all slow at the beginning. Yeah, but you know, it it's a a flip when yes. you have to 
realize that you're not in charge, that there is communication that is being demonstrated, but you have to pay attention and not just insist on the uh, perspective that you think is going to be valuable. And that, you know, that's actually um, a subject of a paper that I'm working on with some fellow scientists that indeed paying attention to your, your uh, non-human subjects can actually improve science research. And that's, you know, that's a totally different way of doing uh, cognition research for sure. Well, yeah, it's a totally uh, non-Cartesian, shall we say. Yes, yes. Uh, and um, let me just say that, um, you've never felt as out of control as you will feel in the water with a 400 pound dolphin swimming around you. Mm -hmm. You don't know how to swim at all. You may think you know how to swim, but you're built all wrong for swimming and the dolphin is going to teach you that. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, a flip for yeah. a lot of science to realize that we can learn what the protocol should be if we actually pay attention to our subjects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really fascinating. I think also linking, I mean, just thinking about what we heard today from Oscar with, with the books, I think that this is part of creating this space in which, you know, discursively we understand that there are connections that we don't necessarily see day to day, you know, between ourselves and other species and giving the space to those species. And I think what's really important for me, you know, I host all of these lecture series and I see the scientific perspective and I'm seeing also today the, the perspective from the humanities. I think it's, it's really crucial that when we have this conversation about interspecies communication, interspecies internet, is that we keep this forum alive with very diverse perspectives because we're always bringing new information and new material to the conversation. Um, and I think that this is, this is what this forum in particular is about. So this is very powerful and I think very, very useful for our community to have these different perspectives come in. Are there any final may, questions? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Patricia, yeah. May, may I just uh, ask mm -hmm. Oscar this? Roger Payne, who so sadly just died recently, mm -hmm. um, he and I spent a great deal of time talking about how important the arts and humanities are to actually translating science so that it actually has an impact on society. And one of the things that I'm concerned about is that there is a passivity to books it requires uh, really no uh, strong reaction from the reader to go out and actually do something. But the arts can, and you know, they have been proven, uh, particularly with the Save the Whale movement, that if you actually see art as not just a reactive, but actually a communicative uh, resource, then it's the, the beautiful cohesion of science and the arts that can actually change behavior in society. And so, you know, when you are framing your work, how are you engaging artists so that they are actually actors and not responders? Great question. Yes. Um, so part of it is that um, the part of the library idea is that it creates this type of new conversations. The books, I I completely agree. The books can be as passive uh, as objects as you as you want them to be. And my and part of my concept is that a lot of these books are already being produced. A lot of these documents are already being printed. 
and they end up in the shelves of the artists because they don't have um, a budget to produce uh, thousands of copies. They can only produce 10 copies, 50, 100 max. And they end up being getting lost somewhere, never to be accessed. So part of the incentive of this, idea, this project is, can we at least acknowledge that they exist, sort of gathering in one place and present to the world this idea that these I, these are being uh, these are things that are being researched on right now that are being proposed. These are manifestos, proposals, um, very interesting ideas. Um, and so this becomes a hub. I would say the most exciting thing about the project has been having people over, talking about things and initiating new projects, new actions, new new ideas, new um, new exhibitions just from the conversation that happened here or people meeting here from different co different countries. Um, to give you an idea, uh, an, an artist came uh, February 2022 from Italy, was doing a residency uh, here in Brooklyn, came to see the collection and uh, almost exactly a year after, sent to me the book that he produced based on, it was so inspired that he was started to research uh, microplastic pollution in the ocean and how that might affect the evolution of uh, deep sea organisms. And he produced this beautiful book that he called Interspecies Kin. The artist is Giovanni Chiamenti. And so that to me was a, a really exciting moment of this project. It was, it's not just these passive books, it's this uh, sort of um, um, documents that trigger new ideas and new directions, new investigations that are later uh, activated in some other way. Ronnie, would you like to ask your question? Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Patricia. Sure. Okay. I, I kind of wanted to say something in response to Malcolm Brenner's comment. Um, I am not a scientist or a researcher. I am a retired veterinarian, but I have a lot of thoughts about interspecies communication. And one of the things is really learning to listen. And that means listening to the animals and how they communicate, whether it's sound or chemical or other modalities, but also to listen to the people who spend a lot of time with animals because a scientist can design an experiment to look at a certain feature but there are people who spend their whole lives trying to communicate back and forth with animals and when you're a veterinarian trying to help an animal you have to try to communicate to them that your intentions are good but you also have to learn their type of communication because it works better. And so I wanna just put in a plug for the scientific community to be sure to listen to people who spend huge amounts of time with animals, whether it's veterinarians or ranchers or uh, shepherds, um, animal breeders and trainers. And you know, like we had in another one of our presentations, somebody talking about how the, um, um, I don't know if it's Inuit people, but people of the Northern cultures that knew where the orcas were hiding under the ice, which um, the scientists would never have figured out because they had for generations been learning to look for them. So I just think we need to really listen to people who spend huge amounts of time with animals and to listen to the animals, of course. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Ronnie. I think that's absolutely true. I think, you know, it's not just about the interspecies communication, but it's also about this collaboration here, right? We we have the most incredible mix of people that come together in this forum. It's what I was saying before, you know, it's not just humanities and science, it's all, all of the different areas in which our interests and our efforts can combine. And I I really feel that this this forum creates that that space. So it's wonderful that you join us. Ronnie, and we have your your inputs there. Uh, Safia, would you like to ask your question? 
Can you hear me? We can, yes. Great. Just the interspecies communication and what the vet was saying. I'm sure we probably have talked about this in prior calls, but there's the Instagram account for Parrot Kindergarten, where this lady trains parrots. They can make video calls to their friends. And she's actually been working with a little, and I don't remember the breed, but a little fish, and lets the fish pick what tank decorations it has that day and what books it wants. And the, the way the fish flutters its fins is how it communicates and it picks book or, and I forget the other thing she offers the fish, but this fish is named Hannah and it loves books. The parrot loves dinosaur books. There's a lot of opportunity for interspecies communication. Amazing. So we not only making the books about the interspecies communication, but the next level is almost inception where the animals are also enjoying the books I think that this is it has to be part of the, the project in a way I mean that's fascinating yeah. and Safia you, you talk about the the parrot um, project we will hopefully have one of the researchers that has been working on um, the parrot uh, project which is I'm not sure it's the same one but a parrot calling system video calling system in the next few months so I hope that we can have that because it's it's quite an interesting way to look at the social structures of animals and how you know the domestic space actually becomes you know disruptive to those so it's a very interesting project um, oh it's did, fascinating um, and the parrot can manage its own menu in the ipad it's incredible yeah incredible I mean yeah it also makes sense because these parrots, they really want to talk with their friends. They're a very social animal. So I guess that this is, you know, how they get around that. Ronnie, did you have another comment on this? I had a great experience with uh, Nandy Conyer, a small parrot that I adopted from a rescue and had for 14 years. And she watched movies with me and very emphatically expressed her preference for musicals and color. And she was horrified by black and white and that she would scream about that. And she sometimes commented on the action in the movie. So it was clear that she was using cognitive speech. And I really was trying to learn her stuff as she was trying to learn my stuff. It was a great experience. And I hope that more people will just learn to respect the creatures that they're with and find out what they have to offer. Wonderful. I think that, you know, I, yeah, these are the kinds of experiences that brings us here. And I think that these are the ones that also galvanize us to, to be working and to be, you know, enthusiastic about this field. Because when you have those experiences, it's like, we were saying before, when you're swimming with a dolphin, you really understand that you are not designed to swim. It's the same thing, you know. You have these really interesting animal uh, encounters and it really changes changes everything. Um, any other questions? Or maybe in the interest of time, we might start to wrap it up. I don't know if there's any other questions for Oscar. I will add, or maybe Oscar, if you would like to put the information about uh, the interspecies library into the Slack, that way people can make sure that they jump on and have a look at uh, your website and have a look and see if there's any, you know, artists who are creating books in their communities that might be interested to donate or even to come and visit. I know we had one eager visitor, so you might have somebody coming in November from the community, which is fantastic. Um, but yeah, make sure if you do have any questions or anything, Oscar, you are available. If anybody wants to reach out, that's correct. Yes. Um, yeah, I'll share my information in the Slack and um, yeah, interspeciouslibrary.com or Instagram interspeciouslibrary. If you want to see more updates happening uh, weekly. Otherwise, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, and uh, yeah, reach out to me if you have any more questions. Thank you, Oscar. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a really great weekend. We will see you next month for our next installment. And yeah, enjoy the weekend. Thanks for joining us.